The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christie's.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. It's our 250th podcast. And in this special episode, we focus on the future. What's next for the visual arts? We ask leading figures from across the art world to tell us about their hopes and concerns for the visual arts in the immediate future. Among them are Max Hollein, director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, Benedict Savoy, co-author of the Saar Savoy Report into the Restitution of Cultural Heritage, Shanai Javeri, head of visual arts at the Barbican in London, the Berlin-based curator Bonaventure Sobejen de Kung, Kimberly Pinder, the dean of the Yale School of Art, and the artist Tomas Saraceno. I'm also joined by three core members of the art newspapers team and regular guests in the first 249 episodes of this podcast. Editors at large, Christina Ruiz and Georgina Adam and our contemporary art correspondent, Louisa Buck, discuss the present and future of museums and heritage, art and artists and the art market. A reminder that you can subscribe to the art newspaper by visiting our website and clicking the subscribe link at the top left of the homepage. You can choose from a digital, complete or student subscription. Do also subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening and to our sister podcast, A Brush With, which is back next week. And do leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. So let's begin with the hopes and concerns of some of the art world's leading figures. I'm Max Hollein, director of the Metropolitan Museum in New York. It is my hope that museums can not only continue to participate in the broader cultural discussion, but that they are actually going to be the places where, despite all the political divisions and despite all the challenges that we are seeing in regard to how we as a world are coming together, that they are indeed are going to be the places bring people together, where basically cultures convene across borders and nations, where people learn more about each other, both individually, but actually also about how the other is actually something that we are all one, and it's all one, so to say, common history. On the other hand, in that context, museums can be really about educating, experiencing ideas that might not be familiar but that it might become something that uh, expands our knowledge, our understanding, makes us maybe at the beginning uncomfortable, but actually at the end of the day raises awareness, understanding, and also a feeling of us being all together in a world that we live in. I think that these are just very important aspects also of what a museum uh, can do. And probably in this currently very divisive world, a museum is one of the very few places where you actually can connect in a non-divisive way, in a non-polemic way, and where you can create more understanding and more compassion and respect for each other. My deep concern is the rising amount of nationalism that we see all over the world. And obviously that has a deep effect on everything, but it has also an effect of how museums can continue to thrive. Nationalism fuels the idea that basically there are clear dividers between countries and that they imagine divisions between cultures. So the idea of nationalism goes against a certain level of cultural dialogue. It might also create misconceptions, uh, different narratives that are not actually closer to the truth, but quite the opposite. It might also create an environment where we are not or no longer able to invite other voices into our narratives, into our storytelling. So I think that nationalism, the way that we are experiencing it now, and the way it's being used also in populist ways, is a virus. It's a virus that can really create issues and tensions, not only on the political spectrum of things, but really also in regard to how museums are being seen, how they can operate, and also how, how you can actually go through a museum. The Met is all about not only showing so to see different cultures, but really also showing the cultural dialogues and showing actually also how cross currents of cultures kind of fueled our whole kind of history and the whole evolution of humankind. All of that could be in jeopardy if we see more and more of this nationalistic beliefs being pushed and fostered in a political way. 
Benedict Savoy speaking. I am a professor of art history in Berlin and my expertise lies in the history of spoliations and the restitution of cultural heritage, particularly to the African continent. As the debates and the physical return of collections to the Republic of Benin and Nigeria in recent years have shown, the restitution of cultural heritage looted by colonial powers has become ethically irreversible. But restitution does not simply mean moving museum objects from A to B and from B to A, not just working hard on their provenances or looking at the collusion between museums and the colonial machine in the past. Restitution is a commitment to the future. It means calling for a new ethical relationship between the dispossessed powers and those who have accumulated the heritage of humanity in their museums. It means believing in the power of cultural heritage to empower or re-empower societies. And it also means trusting in the way societies will reconnect with their heritage. So for the immediate future, I hope that the restitution movement will continue and that the processes of cultural reappropriation and reconnection underway on the African continent will give rise to unprecedented artistic and cultural uh, fertilization. I have no concerns that it might go wrong. Hi, I'm Shanae Javeri, the head of visual arts at the Barbican Center in London. I wanted to first wish the podcast a happy anniversary. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this collective reflection on the future of the arts. The more I dwelt on the two questions you proposed, what are my hopes and concerns for the arts? I tried to pass them out and I kept finding they could not be separated. In these fraught and distressing times, it seems quite hard to think of concern apart from hope, because if I were to do so, it would be, I think, utter desolation. When confronting the concerns, I feel you need to hold on to something. And maybe the most pressing concern in the arts for me now is simply their autonomy their ability not to be censored, instrumentalized, their meaning to be co-opted. And I want to underscore this by saying the arts are not singular. There are communities and artists working in vastly different sociopolitical contexts, and they have to contend with numerous modes and methods of control. And which leads me to my hope, which is for resilience for the arts and the artists. Stretching back, artists have always confronted hard scenarios and distilled that into their work. And the best of which is not simply reactive, but reflective, and which connects the past to the present and the future. And the work I'm talking about doesn't feel the need to be necessarily fully legible in an instance. It doesn't have to be clearly topical. It insists on the capacity of the capriciousness of the human imagination, and it provides us a view to ponder and to consider. And what it reminds me is that in any enveloping darkness, it is not absolute or monolithic. And really, to truly see in that darkness, some light is required. My name is Anthea Piers. I'm the president of Christie's EMEA. My hope is for the visual arts to be a united force for good. It's becoming ever more important that we collaborate and that we support each other. We are one ecosystem facing similar challenges with, most importantly, similar great opportunity ahead. I see a great hunger for the visual arts, particularly for them to reflect the many narratives that are so important to us all, and increasingly important for the next generations. If we unite together to answer this call, we can be an even more powerful and more important, meaningful force. I see a wonderful growth in collaborations across the visual arts, which is exciting. In our case, as an example, Christie's was the first auction house to sponsor a pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2022. Now, this decision was very much driven from a belief that we should take a role in the wider ecosystem and to support the long-awaited market shifts that we see taking place. For me, a key concern in the visual arts lies in funding. As we know, funding is a key issue for many institutions and artists. 
and they're striving to deliver world-class programming and exhibitions with real challenges to their resources. I hope that our response to this as a visual arts community is to be a united force of support. We need to work together to identify other sources of funding, to collaborate, pool resources, and find ever more creative ways to keep the art strong. We all need to play our part. I am Bonaventuso Bejeng Dikung, amongst many other things, the director of the Haus der Kultur in der Welt in Berlin and a professor of spatial strategies at the Weissenzee Kunsthochschule in Berlin. I think my biggest concern really today is the, the rise of the far right, the rise of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and racism in our societies, but also the incredible rise of neoliberal capitalist structures that take away from people their housing possibilities, their daily bread, so to say. So that is my biggest concern. And we thematize these things in the program at the House of Couture in the Welt. And uh, as my friend, the artist Leo Asimota would say, you know, hope is for the church. So I would reformulate the question and put it, what do I trust would happen in the near future? Which is, in my opinion, we should center togetherness, we should think of a world in relation. We should center love as the foundation on which societies can be built. We should center and trust that if humanity sees itself as one, we could build a better world, a world that considers not only us humans as the center, but everything in this world as having agency and having its own space. And I think. If we think that way, we will be able to tackle the environmental crisis, the capitalist crisis, and political crisis in which we find ourselves. So I trust that the people that are kicking out their brothers and sisters from the sub-Saharan continent of Africa in Tunisia will realize that those are their brothers and sisters. I trust and hope that the people in Saudi Arabia killing refugees from Somalia and Ethiopia that are trying to get into Saudi Arabia through the uh, Yemeni border will realize that we just want humanity. So I think my message is very simple. How do we build a society or societies based on technologies of love and joy? Hello, my name is Tomas Saraceno, and I'm an artist. Well, I start maybe with a concern is uh, yeah, how to live together on planet Earth, and not only humans, but also more than human lives, and how to weave uh, a terrestrial and a cosmic web for, for better justice for all. Yeah, I have been concerning lately on uh, how energy have been extracted in different parts of the world and mostly about how the green energy transition somehow from the global north is impacting disproportionately on the, the global south and mostly on lithium extraction and how much in parts of Argentina communities are suffering from that extractivist approach which follow kind of the same patterns of the colonial times. And one of the hopes that I have been trying through the years to Something that I read the other day, the best technology is justice. So that's quite important uh, of how certain technology had somehow forget about uh, the social structure that needs to be had campaigned and who owned that technology and how these technologies are really at the service of the majority of the habitants of this planet, which do not embrace only humans, right? And how much this also affected disproportionately to different types of, of humans and, and race and and other factors. I'm Clary Wallace, Director of Tony Contemporary in Margate. I've always believed in the importance of creativity and that a rich arts education offers essential skills that extend way beyond the classroom. Importantly, the World Economic Forum also agrees that creativity matters and that it's one of the top three most crucial skills for success. However, arts education for children and young people in the UK is being squeezed. The current system is steering students away from the arts and nudging them towards pathways that rely on rote learning. In neglecting the potential of arts education, I worry that we risk hindering our children's growth and limiting their possibilities. 
On a positive note, the quality of learning offered at museums and galleries across the country always impresses me. Institutions such as Turner Contemporary and Margate, where I work, are all about offering a warm welcome to families, igniting children's creativity through programmes such as our Saturday Cartoon Club or the buzz of activities in our children's art library. All of us museum professionals believe nurturing creativity both helps individuals to reach their full creative potential and to learn to see things differently. This also helps with problem solving in an increasingly complex world. We will continue to ensure that kids don't just grasp the basics, but also master the confidence to think imaginatively. These skills are crucial for whatever path they choose. So now I'm joined by Christina Ruiz, Louisa Buck and Georgina Adam. I wanted to start by talking about museums. Christina, in the hopes and concerns that we've just heard from people across the art world, Max Holland is talking about a noble aim for what museums can be, to be something for everyone to break down borders, to educate and so on. But it seems to me that the job, in a way, for people like Max Holland is harder than ever and museums are under greater pressure perhaps than ever, I would say. I completely agree with that. I I would say that the last few years have been a time of momentous change for museums. And in my opinion, the thing that has changed the most is the expectations that the public places on museums. Because not so long ago, a museum's primary responsibility was understood to be the care, conservation, and study of its collections and the dissemination of scholarship rooted in those collections. Today, museums, particularly museums of contemporary art, uh, are understood to be social spaces where diverse communities can gather and where important outreach to those communities takes place. And museum directors and leadership are expected to embrace progressive causes and to articulate those causes through their institutions. And I'd just like to read you a quote from a story that appeared in Hyperallergic in November 2022 by one of their senior editors called Hakim Bishara. And he wrote this piece in response to a statement that had been put out by the directors of some of our leading museums, including MoMA and the Met in New York and the British Museum here in London, as well as the Louvre in Paris. And the statement was put out in response to these just stop oil protesters who started turning up and chucking soup at paintings. And so Hakim says, the bigger problem here is that these museum directors have a severely narrow understanding of their positions. In their own words, the museum's primary responsibility lies in collecting, researching, sharing, and preserving cultural heritage. No, we need you to do more than that. We need museum directors to become actual cultural leaders who know how to identify and address society's most pressing problems and actively engage in solving them. I'm calling on you to stop thinking like caretakers and start acting like change makers. So whether you agree with Hakeem or not, that's a very radical shift in what we expect museums to be. Uh, And it's happened incredibly quickly. I mean, I started noticing it in response to the Me Too movement uh, and Greta Thunberg's school strikes for the climate. And then, of course, it accelerated in the wake of the murder of George Floyd in 2020 and Black Lives Matter protest in the United States. And museums, which had previously been seen as sort of fusty backwaters that had no real connection to real life in any meaningful way, were thrust to the front line of a generational battle for accountability. So suddenly, everything about museum was called into question by young activists, from their institutional purpose to their collections and how they were obtained, their governance, diversity, workforce, programming, Um, and, of course, their sources of funding. Uh, And activists have forced very real change on institutions, from resignations of key members of staff and trustees to the severing of ties uh, with sources of funding which were judged to be unethical. So to give just a couple of examples, uh, in New York, Warren Candace, a vice chairman of the Whitney Museum of American Art, resigned in 2019 
after months of protests by the group decolonize this place over his ownership of a company that produced tear gas, which was found to have been used uh, on migrants at the US-Mexico border. And then, of course, uh, we had the anti-Sackler protests spearheaded by the artist and photographer Nan Golden, which started in New York at the Guggenheim and the Whitney, and then moved to the Louvre in Paris and uh, the V&A in London, amongst other places. And that has been an incredibly successful campaign, you know, along with the ongoing lawsuits and the amazing journalism done by The New Yorker and Patrick Radden Keefe. Has and led, you, well, it must be said. <laughs> well, to be fair, we were following his lead. But, um, you know, it's led to the near industry-wide repudiation of the Sacklers and the erasure of the name from almost every museum, library and cultural institution on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, and then on top of that, we've seen a wave of unionization of museum staff in the U.S. and to a lesser extent here in Britain as well, um, as employees demand better pay and better working conditions. So I think what's changed drastically in the last few years as well is the expectations of young people coming into institutions who are quite simply appalled by some of the working practices that they see there. And if you talk to museum directors and senior creators privately, there's often a sense that institutions are being held hostage by young members of staff, whereas the young members of staff would say, why have you been willing to put up with these glaring inequalities yeah. in programming and workforce when you have the ability to tackle them head on? Thank you for that summary, Christina, which I think we would all agree with vast tranches of. I'm, I'm really interested in to what extent it's a manageable new expectation. Like, can we expect our museums to be this? Louisa, I don't know if you have any opinion on that. Well, I think you brilliantly summed it up, Christina. And I think it's it's such an interesting shift. That in You know, back in the day, museums told communities what they should be seeing, what the good taste was, what the best art was. You know, the arbiters from on high, the white male pinstriped arbiters usually. But now, of course, it's the communities telling the museums what they should be doing and what they should be thinking about. But what I think is fascinating is that the young generations, the activists, care that much that actually museums are deemed to be sufficiently important, sufficiently temples, okay, yes, of the establishment, but that they're actually going to bother to throw a tin of tomato soup at a Van Gogh in a museum because that's going to get the biggest feedback. So it shows that the museums are incredibly important to people, to communities. They want to claw them back. They want to change the situation. But I love the fact, actually, that museums still really matter. I agree. And I wanted to mention um, just how mainstream these issues and concerns have gone. Now, you're all much more highbrow than I am. So I don't know who amongst you so. <laughs> has seen the uh, Marvel film Black Panther, which came out yes, in course. 2018. Well, if you remember, there's a key scene in that where the actor Michael B. Jordan um, visits a museum, which is intended to be the British Museum. He meets with a curator who is this really smug and condescending and quite ignorant white woman. Uh, then he poisons and kills her. And he retrieves a cultural artifact. I can't remember if it's like a spear or a shield, which had been looted from his country, which is the fictional African country, Wakanda. Um, and that movie, that movie made $1.3 billion. It was seen by a lot, a lot of people. And I just can't remember a mainstream film like that tackling issues of museum repatriation like that. And, and a, on a global platform that's primarily aimed at young people. And for quite a long time after that film came out, whenever issues of perceived racism and injustice were discussed on social media, by young people, they would always put the hashtag Black Panther. And I think that is new. I mean, I can't, I don't know if you yeah, guys no, can Yeah, no, I think you're right. And I think it's really interesting that you picked up on this idea about the division between members of staff. We were hearing the same thing about newspaper offices. There are the old school lefties versus a new, much more activist generation who are campaigners. They are, they are seeing the injustices. They are seeing that they've pro been propelled, even despite the good intention of the liberals that came before them. And I feel that's the same thing in museums. There is a sense in which there is a young generation who has seen the perpetuation of certain ideals continuing 
over decades, even despite the fact we've been hearing about, for instance, diversity, we've been hearing about expanding audiences and so on for men, for decades. You know, I think in the 70s, there was a people first, public first attitude in museums. But I think it also empowers the staff of the museums to, to shake their fists somewhat um, about money, for example. I mean, certainly in the UK, not so much in the US, but I think in Europe as well. It's a really poorly paid sector. I mean, Wonderful to be diverse, wonderful to be egalitarian and, and, and democratic, but you've got to start by paying people. And if, if you pay people properly, all that vanishes. And I think right across the sector, this is something that is absolutely key. We're going to be touching on it again, I think, more about, you know, people from working class, different socioeconomic backgrounds entering. But, you know, look at us a lot, a sea of white middle class faces around this table, you know. And I think that sums up so much still of the art world, both the protesting about what's being shown, but also who's being paid and who's working working there and who can afford to work there. The unionisation issue that you mentioned, Christina, I mean, just not that long ago, a week ago or so, I think the Art Institute of Chicago ratified its first union contract. I think it's been really inspiring to see this happening and, and, and also sort of unbelievable to realise it hadn't, hadn't happened up until now and that American museums have been treating their staff in this way for decades, you know. And even so, in the UK, the unions, they don't have that much heft either. Right, absolutely. I mean, but traditionally, just to return a bit to what you were saying, Louisa, I mean, I remember when I started out in the art world, unpaid. And of course, I worked unpaid for at least a year because I could afford to, because I was living at home with my parents. And I know a lot of people who started like that in the art world. I did too. I volunteered. Yep, me too. I remember the mentality of these museums historically has been, you know, it's a privilege to work here and we are helping you with your career and therefore you're going to work for us without getting paid. And I think that, you know, young people today just say, no, thank you. And I think also with artists as well, this is certainly the case in some of our major museums in the UK. I'm not so sure about the US, but I would think it probably is the case where, you know, production fees, if you haven't got a big dealer working with you, a big gallerist, Artists are paid very, very little for major exhibitions because it's deemed to be a great thing. Well, you can't eat prestige, whatever part of the sector you're in. That's right. I mean, we focused on that a little on this podcast, and I'm sure we will be in the future. This idea that, and I think a lot of people wouldn't know this until it's being ex- gradually exposed, is that museums have been paying artists terribly, way below the minimum wage given their labour and stuff. But this is what I mean about the manageability of all this, because actually it's a juggernaut. The museum's world is a juggernaut. It has behaved in a certain way for so long. I wonder how quickly it can be turned around, given the structures of governance that we see around us. Well, I I think museums are facing massive challenges right now, not least very severe financial pressures. I mean, they're still struggling to recover audiences post-pandemic lockdowns, and they are simultaneously being forced to sever ties with some of their major funders. Uh, following public pressure. So not just the Sacklers, but obviously oil and gas companies, Russian oligarchs, weapons manufacturers are all now largely seen as unacceptable funders of cultural institutions. Uh, And in the United States, where museums rely massively on their wealthy trustees, uh, the scrutiny of those trustees is going to be a major challenge for institutions going forward. Uh, The Metropolitan recently announced a major effort to review its antiquities and their provenance and return, where appropriate, items to source countries. And that followed a raid on the home of one of their long-serving trustees and very generous benefactor, Shelby White, who uh, was visited by the Manhattan District Attorney and had several items confiscated. And then several more were confiscated from the Met Museum, which had been on loan from Shelby White. So, you know, I mean, arguably the Met should have been reviewing the provenance of its antiquities a long time ago. But, you know, let's applaud the fact that they've turned up to this party rather than point out that they are quite late. Or indeed the BM yes. safeguarding I mean, the safety of its artefacts in the first place. Never mind where they came from. That's another huge issue as well, of course. In my opinion, what comes next is that rather than dealing with these crises on a case-by-case basis, museums need a pretty radical rethink of what their purpose is and how they operate. Uh, because any money that they make in the future is going to be scrutinized far more than it ever has been. And I don't think we should underestimate how challenging this is going to be for museums, because despite their sometimes progressive public pronouncements, 
Museums are, in fact, deeply conservative. And museums do not change unless there's a pandemic or there are people picketing outside or the district attorney turns up and confiscates antiquities. Right. They have to be forced to change. And I would argue, in my opinion, that museums should be doing far less than they currently do. They should be organizing fewer exhibitions, which last much longer, focus more on their permanent collections. And this relentless drive for one blockbuster exhibition after another, I think, should end. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because I had conversations pretty early into the early stages of the COVID pandemic. And I spoke to Dan Weiss at the Met and I spoke to Francis Morris, at the, then at the Tate, who's now left, of course. And there was this real emphasis on we're going to do more with our collections. Now, I have seen wonderful exhibitions since then, since we got back to something like normal. But it doesn't seem like the blockbuster conveyor belt is in any way being halted. I, I can't see well, a no, massive shift in, but, in that but direction. But at the moment, their entire business model is based on the blockbuster exhibition because that's where, in this country, they can charge uh, entrance fees for exhibitions uh, because national museums are free. And uh, they can raise sponsorship. So they're going to have to rethink that whole structure because it is just not working. There's a huge problem too, isn't there? And the museums are now being much more international, more global. They want to represent, you know, new art centres that, that were never the traditional North American, Northern Europe situation. But... To show work from all these different parts of the world, to introduce artists from these different parts of the world requires travel, which everyone's trying to be more environmentally sustainable at the moment. I'm going to be talking more about that, I know. But also to raise money to make these exhibitions travel to different places, different locations. We're back on the old blockbuster Sharabang again, not to mention, as you say, the fundraising. So it's a whole kind of you know reversal of, of, of what they're meant to be doing. I wonder, do you think we've seen the full extent of the impact of COVID on museums yet? It's one of the things that in a few discussions I've had with people in museums, there's been these, this sort of hint that there's a sort of masking of the full effect of closing for so long and the still late return of visitors. There, you know, Lots of museums reported a much smaller audience since COVID. So I wonder if we're yet to see the full effect of it. For instance, I noticed that lots of museums in the US have started raising their general admission prices, most recently yes. SF MoMA. That's a factor, I think. You can see these sort of bellwethers of potential financial distress <laughs> emerging. Absolutely. And of course, the blockbuster shows that they're putting on now will have been in the pipeline a long time before COVID started. So, you know, those still have to play out. Uh, and, and I agree. I don't think we've seen the full effects. And in this country where free museum entry was introduced by Tony Blair's Labour government in 2001, I think the issue of charging for museums has to go back on the table. Uh, and people have started publicly calling for that, you know, in various opinion pieces in newspapers with adequate provision made for students and, you know, people who cannot afford to pay. Uh, but, uh, you know, just to give one example, writing in the Evening Standard, Simon Jenkins noted that visitors to the British Museum, for example, are 60% foreign tourists who happily pay for museums everywhere else in Europe. And he asked, why should British taxpayers subsidise these visitors? Georgina. I just wonder, has they've lost all of that funding because of the Sacklers or the uh, oil and gas industries? The problem is the trustees, because they need to make money from somebody. And unfortunately, the trustees are not from the sort of backgrounds that are diverse. The trustees are still white male and probably pinstriped as well, although we're not absolutely sure about that. That's absolutely true. I really want to talk about governance a bit at, at museums because I think it's really important. In the US, for instance, there was a, a statistic, a, astonishing statistic in 2017, that 46% of museum boards were all white. That's six years ago. Now, there's a Black Trustee Alliance that's been founded and other organisations, but that is, again, talking about juggernauts to turn round. You know, there's a lot of work that needs to go into the changing of trustees in order to change the attitudes, right? Because there's also this other thing, which is that trustees are now being trusted in the US with appointing a new generation of museum directors. So uh, you've read the article which we have in the current issue, which is by Julia Halperin, 
Louisa, about this very issue? Well, it comes back to, I think, actually a kind of cornerstone for all the things we've been talking about, which is transparency. You know, if you're transparent in your governance, you're transparent in how you appoint your new directors, which as far as I can see, it's absolutely the opposite. It's positively opaque. It's positively not like, like, like the new Pope being, you know, distinguished by, by a puff of smoke by the cardinals. I mean, it's so mysterious how these museums appoint their directors. And as you say, there's this big tranche of new directors, particularly in America, who are due to be appointed it should be done with full transparency. And also, as regards the funding and the, and the white pinstripe male trustees, there are many new economies, like there are many new art worlds and art productions and artists and art markets. You have to go find the new economies, go find the new entrepreneurs, find the people who are making money out of the traditional trustee gene pool, as it were. And I think, you know, there'll be some pleasant surprises. You've got to go find them. While we're talking about funding, I wanted to talk about political interference as well, because I think this is an interesting thing. There's, a, there's an article by the artist Bob and Roberta Smith in the latest edition of the art newspaper in which he points out the utter ridiculousness that we have sitting MPs on museum boards. We've heard that the Republican um, senators are trying to block the public funding of the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Latino. We've seen in Poland, in Hungary and right across other regimes, which are frankly far right across Europe, that there is an interference in the appointment of individuals. And it seems to me that this is another big issue we're going to see more and more, especially in the cases where we're seeing growing nationalism, which is what Max Holloyne is clearly so concerned about. Well, I agree. And actually, just to return to what Louisa said earlier, I mean, the good news about that is that it shows that culture really does matter. So, Yay for that. But I mean, obviously, to, to be more serious, it is very concerning. I mean, in, in Britain, you know, we were used to basically decades where nobody really interfered with art at all. You'd get the occasionally some MP saying, oh, that's not very in very good taste. And why don't they show, you know, some old masters instead or whatever. But it was not an active attempt to interfere with, you know, what people are showing or, or acquiring or et cetera. And that is very concerning. Uh, but I think it's because, you know, culture, as I said earlier, is at the front line of these struggles and debates and uh, misinformation as well that is taking place at the moment. And on that note, I'd, I'd like to mention, just to finish, uh, a... a um, concerning development which we've been writing about for a few years which is the museum rush to make money in China. Uh, the Pompidou Museum in Paris as you know has had a branch in Shanghai for many years while the Victoria and Albert Museum and the Tate in London all have long-standing collaborations in China and the Uffizi Museums in Florence recently signed a 6 million euro agreement to send 10 shows to the Bundwan Art Museum in Shanghai over five years. And even museums that don't actually have partnerships in China are increasingly sending exhibitions there. Uh, the National Gallery recently closed um, a show of 50 paintings that had loaned to Shanghai uh, in a show called Botticelli to Van Gogh. And that show broke all attendance records for the National Gallery for a paid exhibition, far surpassing the previous record holder, which was the Leonardo show in 2011, with, of course, the infamous Salvatore Mundi. So nobody's saying that cultural exchanges are a bad thing. However, I would argue that when you are partnering with companies that are owned by the Chinese state which is responsible for the worst atrocities, that you perhaps have either an obligation to say something publicly or for European museums, which are largely funded by the taxpayer, to discuss these collaborations with the people who fund you, i.e. the public. And you found that people haven't been wanting to discuss it with you as a journalist making inquiries about it? No, not at all. Uh, and the reality is that, you know, the human rights abuses are uh, simply atrocious. I mean, there's the suppression of protest in Hong Kong, there's the network of concentration camps in the Xinjiang region, which are currently housing as we speak, about one million Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims, uh, forced labor, the taking of organs from Uyghur and Falun Gong prisoners while they are still alive to service a very lucrative black market trade in China, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
So if you remember, in 2011, Ai Weiwei was arrested by Chinese authorities and he disappeared for nearly three months. At the time, Tate in London, as well as many other museums in Europe and the United States, organized events and exhibitions to protest his detention. For example, one thing Tate Modern did was to install 10 tons of his handcrafted porcelain sunflower seeds in the galleries. And then director Chris Durkon told journalists that, and I quote, Tate remains deeply concerned about Ai Weiwei's detention. Recent events have made sunflower seeds an ever more poignant commentary on the importance of the individual in society. At a time when I cannot speak freely for himself, it is important that his message continues to be heard through his art. So my question is this. If Ai Weiwei were detained again today, now that Tate has entered into a highly lucrative partnership with a state-owned property developer in Shanghai, a city where, by the way, Ai Weiwei's art cannot be shown because it is censored, what would Tate say and what would Tate do? I think we probably don't know the answer, do we, Louisa? I think it's very interesting that when I've talked to various museum people about these links, particularly with China, they always emphasise that they're dealing with individuals, not the state. And of course, what Christina says now completely refutes that. So I think there's been a lot of smoke and mirrors and obfuscation. So I think the jury is very much out on how Tate would respond. Um, I think we need to talk about Saudi Arabia here because it re relates very directly to this whole question of ethics. There is clearly a massive soft power grab going on from Saudi Arabia at the moment. We've seen a major curator who's been a beloved director of the Whitechapel Gallery in London, Ivana Blaswick, become a curatorial lead for Alula, which is a state-funded uh, contemporary art project in Saudi Arabia. We've also seen, again, agreements being signed with the Centre Pompidou, this incredible embedded of the French state and Saudi Arabia. I think this is the, if you like, the, the next ethical dilemma for the art world that we're, we're going to be discussing a lot more. Christina? Well, what I would say is that, you know, I think there's a difference between, you know, what private individuals do, like Yvonne Blaswick. I mean, she's just representing herself now, so she's free to take a job wherever she wants if her personal ethics allow it. And what taxpayer-funded museums do, museums that profess certain principles and then just are happy to throw those out the window, you know, when there's serious money up for grabs. And yes, France is quite happy to collaborate with almost anyone, it seems, you know, not just China, Saudi Arabia, and of course, there's the Louvre, Abu Dhabi, if they can make money out of it. And in fact, when I asked the president of the Pompidou uh, about these issues a couple of years ago, uh, his response was very interesting. He said, look, as a, you know, as a national museum, the Pompidou follows the lead of government. You know, we're not going to make foreign policy. That's not our role. What we do is we follow the lead that our government sets for us. And that is clear. Right. And again, but again, it brings it back to that. What expectations has a young visitor to a museum who may not vote for that government, that their cultural institutions would somehow resist a governmental line? It's a really, that's part mm. of this whole changing outlook, this, this tightrope that museums are facing as, as we move forwards. Now, of course, another massive ethical issue for the art world is climate change. Louisa, this is one of your specialties. Um, tell us where you think we're at, what we can expect in the immediate future in relation to climate change. Well, you know, we're not in a climate change, we're in a climate catastrophe. And I think it's so interesting that, you know, governments, institutional bodies, national bodies across the globe, outside the art world, really should be responding to the climate and environmental catastrophe in the same way that they did with COVID. It's arguably going to cause many, many more deaths and have much greater consequence. However, we know this is not the case. Things are pootling along. Um, I have an, a column in the art newspaper I, with a raised sardonic eyebrow called Green is the New Black, because Green certainly has become the new black in the art world. Everyone is wearing their green colours on their sleeves. Everybody is jumping up and down trying to sort of show that they're, they're being greener than thou. And um, I've, I'm part of something called the Gallery Climate Coalition, which now started a few people talking about trying to make a difference. And now it's over a thousand members throughout the sector, all committing and showing now active commitment to getting their carbon down by at least 50% by 2030 in line with the Paris Accord and achieving near zero waste. But, you know, 
people still aren't really doing this. I mean, the private jets are still on the up and up. The art world swans around on private jets constantly. Um, museums and galleries are still very much, you know, their, their, their shipping is taking place predominantly by air, not by sea. Efforts are being made. Many of the institutions actually are being a lot better. They have actually appointed various kind of environmental consultants or in, indeed in the case of Tate, Serpentine, the Guggenheim, environmental curators. So, you know, efforts are being made, but... There's still a hell of a lot more to be done, but the consciousness is now there. You cannot now get public funding in the UK without doing a proper carbon audit. You know, you have to be able to show what you're doing, but it's it's still a, a long way to go. Um, one of the things I'm aware of, Georgina, this is absolutely something you've written about, is the art world has an addiction to the 1%. It needs the 1% to keep it going. There are or the 0.001% or whatever mm -hmm. we're calling it. It needs billionaires. The private jets question is never going to get addressed unless the art world starts dealing with this toxic relationship it has with, it, with billionaires, right? Yes, but the trouble is that for a lot of for auction houses, for galleries, they need to sell extremely expensive art. And who buys the extremely expensive art is the people with the private jets. And so I really don't know. And I'm afraid that I don't think that a lot of those people really care about their carbon footprint, whether it be in the art market or anything else, their holidays in Aspen, followed by a holiday somewhere else and then their yacht. I think what's going to be the interesting thing in the art world, and it's starting now, is the art market, the art world, the art sector is the most status conscious, the most embarrassed, the most looking in the rearview mirror, what's cool, what's in, what's out. Green has become the new black, but it's got to become really the new black. And I think the people who are the, the future holds in our hands, it's the artists. If artists, high ranking artists with galleries, everyone listens to the artists at the top end of the sphere. Of course, that's the 1% too of artists in the art world. But if they start really laying down the law and saying they won't sell to institutions, they want to know what the green plan is for an institution. They want to know what a collector's situation is. They want they want proper nuts and bolts information from their galleries, from their collectors, from the sector at large. That, I think, will be the only thing, frankly, that will make a difference. And we're going to be talking a bit more about this, I think. But artists, I think, are very much taking the lead in many, many initiatives across the board, either obliquely or directly. One of the other aspects of climate change that will come to artists again a bit later. But one of the things I want to talk about in relation to to the climate emergency is global heritage because one of the things that I'm really conscious of is that in the same way that you can't ignore the artist getting extremely concerned about the climate emergency, the fate of heritage as we continue to see extreme weather events, whether that's flooding in Italy, the wildfires in North America or, so, or whatever it is, we're going to see heritage disappearing. And I wonder if that also will become a massive emergency, a big klaxon. There's, you know, UNESCO are going to be discussing Venice's status and whether it is actually finally going to be putting it on the endangered list. This sort of thing, it's seeing these kind of, and I'm going to use this horrible word, iconic sites becoming endangered. Remember the reaction to Notre Dame being on fire? If you see extreme weather events destroying major world heritage, again, is that going to be a call to action at last? Yes, in a word. I think these things, these images count for so much. And I think this is why the art, the art sector, even though, of course, it's nothing compared to aviation or construction or, you know, petrochemicals or whatever. It's a tiny sector, but it punches way above its weight because we deal in images. We deal with identifiable images. We have fantastic power to be able to be lightning rods, hence the tomato soup on the Van Gogh in, in the museum, not in parliament or outside of, you know, a church or a mosque or, or whatever. You know, it's very interesting how we have this huge power to do this. And I think it's interesting there are good initiatives being made in the art world now. And I think, for example, just hot off the press, we're gonna, they're going to be announcing it actually in the, in the UN Sustainability Week um, in, in, later, later on this month, uh, CIMAM, which is the International Committee of Museums and, and Collections of Modern Art, have joined together with GCC, the charity I'm involved with, to, to make up a charter for climate action with the UN, with this organisation called Art 2030, which want to get the UN sustainable goals reflected in the art world. So it's joining up these dots at last. The art world is now becoming enmeshed with the UN, the UN's ideas of sustainability, and this really has muscle and heft. So I, I am cautiously optimistic that more is being done, but more, of course, still needs to be done. OK, well, we're going to take a break now, but we'll be back with more of the hopes and concerns of leading art world figures and then more from Louisa, Christina and Georgina soon. But first, here's this week's news bulletin. 
The first evening auction of the private collection of Freddie Mercury, the late frontman of the rock band Queen, made £12.2 million with fees, exceeding the pre-sale high estimate of £7.2 million and already hitting the high estimate for the entire series of sales. Every lot sold, including Mercury's 1973 Yamaha Grand Piano for more than £1.7 million with fees and the autograph working lyrics for Queen's most famous hit, Bohemian Rhapsody, for more than £1.3 million. The German government's advisory commission on Nazi looted art has called for increased powers and a new restitution law. The 10-member panel was created 20 years ago to deliver non-binding recommendations on claims submitted by the heirs of art owners persecuted by the Nazis for works in public institutions. But panel members say that claimants should be permitted to ask the panel for a recommendation even when the current holder has refused to submit a contested work for consideration. An example is the portrait of Madame Soler by Pablo Picasso in the Bavarian state painting collections, which the state of Bavaria has refused to submit to the panel, arguing that the portrait was not sold as a result of Nazi persecution. The Picasso case has exposed the shortcomings of the current system, the commission says. And finally, day trippers to Venice will soon have to pay a €5 Euro admission fee to the city in a bid to stem the deluge of short-term tourism in the city. The scheme to be implemented next spring will be run on a trial basis, though the exact dates will be outlined after final council approval of the plan, expected on the 12th of September. Ticket holders will need to download a QR code on their phone, which may be checked by inspectors. Those exempt from paying the fee include children aged under 14, tourists staying overnight in hotels and Airbnb, properties, students in the city and of course Venice residents. You can read all these stories and reports from this week's art fairs, The Armoury Show in New York and Free Soul at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS and Android. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. This fall, Asian Art Week returns to New York with nine live and online auctions from across Asia. Extraordinary provenance reigns this season, which features the archaic bronzes and ceramic from prominent dealer Mineo Hatta, the Chinese jade carvings of the LJZ collection, porcelain from the era of the Wanli Emperor from Marchant, and treasured Buddhist objects from the art dealer Mok Mokotov. Top works by Makbul Fida Hussain and Katsushika Hokusai round out an exciting series of sales. The exhibition at Rockefeller Center begins on the 15th of September. In the meantime, explore the sales at Christie's.com. I'm back with Louisa Georgina and Christina shortly, but first, here are some more hopes and concerns for the future from Art World Figures. My name is Kimberly Pinder, and I am the Stavros Narcos Foundation Dean at the Yale School of Art. We've had yet another terrible event where another young white man carrying out hate crimes has taken some black lives, people of color. And when I read that story and heard about it, I found myself searching for poetry and looking through my art books. <laughs> and that's what made me think, wow, is this something that art can help us with, right? And I feel like I have at an art school a lot of optimism because I see optimism in this crucible because artists make, unmake and remake this world in their studios, in their heads, in their hearts, mostly for themselves. But when they share it, they can disrupt the sleepwalking and the apathy and the grief that at this moment I feel that is so pervasive, no matter where you are in the world, unfortunately. And for me, I am very optimistic about the fact that so many more cities and foundations are supporting public art, which is my field, bringing the impact of Civil War memorials and other commemorative art into a public discourse has essentially, for me as an art historian, democratized art history. It's been one of the biggest and most impactful open source art history classes ever. I had the privilege of actually serving as a commissioner on the Boston Arts Commission during these past few really contentious years around where monuments and removing them. And I always recount when during public comment to remove a statue that we all know by Thomas Ball of Lincoln with a kneeling enslaved black man. And this mother said that she walks by the statue often and she said that one day her little black boy looked at it and asked her, is that me? That for me was kind of all that needed to be said about what this type of work 
can do to people and also for people. And I love taking that story back to students who are making art and to use that as a way to talk about the impact that their work has on their audiences and also themselves when they're making it and wanting to deal so much with activism, activist art, really tough topics. What worries me being at an art school and, you know, they're really torn up about where they're going and the tension that's created by the whims of a very volatile and unregulated art market. Something that they talk about a lot because they're taking on debt and making a commitment to come here to get an MFA to then be launched into such an unpredictable future. And the culture of speculation that makes art commerce a runaway train is alarming. No one can predict, even though they say they can, what influential collector or national crisis can completely turn the art market upside down. Who could have predicted what a self-shredding painting or a cop filmed kneeling on the neck of a black man could have done to art sales the way that we have seen what happened to art sales and the way that the art market has shifted, pivoted quickly, randomly it seems, towards certain artists and away from others. That is something that's very concerning to me. The fact that such disparate events can have an impact really brings us right back to my optimism, I guess, when I talk about, in a weird way, how art can disrupt all these things that it can do. And that keeps me going with what we can look for with art and how it can help us. My name is Ellie Pennick and I am the director and founder of Guts Gallery. My concern is the current absence of working class gallerists, curators and artists participating in the art world. I hope the solution lies in developing accessible courses and providing financial assistance to facilitate their involvement and create equality within the class system in the art world. I'm Neil Wenman, I'm Global Creative Director of House and Worth. And I guess my hope is that the art world's now become a global constellation of hotspots and over the last decade or so, there's been a cultural consciousness that's beyond the sort of presupposed capitals that we used to know. And maybe cross-pollination of ideas, thanks to digital, and as all becoming more interconnected, has given the opportunity for artists outside of the mainstream or the main centres to gain visibility. So I guess my hope is that access to art continues to open up to even wider audiences, not just for the art lover, but also the artists themselves. And my concern is that as a London graduate, in a time when grants and scholarships covered your fees and often your living, I greatly benefited from the arts higher education system in London and when I first joined the art world about 20 years ago, I guess after that, it gave me such a foundation, which I still value today and I draw upon still today in my conversations and the way I approach exhibitions. And so the crazy thing is that, you know, the arts is, still have to fight to justify their value and the enormous benefit to the wider society goes relatively unnoticed or unrecognised in terms of funding. And I'd like to see that change. So. We're in a climate where funding for arts and design courses has been cut by 50% to focus on what's called higher value subjects. And UK arts schools are a magnet for creative people from all over the world. And I just hope that this amazing crucible of ideas and creativity can thrive and that the sort of vitality of the system can be reborn and people can understand the importance of the ecosystem. I'm Vincenzo De Bellis. I'm the director of fairs and exhibition platforms at Art Basel. And what I do is that I oversee all the fairs of the Art Basel group and also new activities that we want to do in the field of live events. Well, my hope for the art world is that we continue, that the art world continues to bring artists that have historically been at the margins of the discourse more and more at the forefront. In general, I think bringing artists in conversations and their activities, it's very, very important. And I think a truly inclusive and diverse art world will be very important to reflect the world we live in. 
my concern is actually linked to this. It's less of a concern and more of, of a hope that we actually don't forget that working with artists is one of the most inspiring things that we have when we can do in the art world. Whether it's for a show or a fair, biennials or a festival, if we really want to be authentic with, in the art world, we always have to follow the artists. They are the one who should guide us all the time. And my kind of concern is that we forget this and my hope is that we really don't forget that. So my name is Antonia Caicedo Olguin. I am a figurative painter. I just graduated from the Slade School of Fine Art and now I'm an artist based in London. I think my hope stems from things that I've seen happen recently in the art world. There's a bigger support for emerging artists. I think that's very important. So I hope that that's something that's going to keep happening. I also hope that technologies are used to support emerging artists too. I've seen also an increase in small galleries and young art collectors. I think that's very important for artists who are starting, not necessarily artists who are young, but maybe artists who didn't go to art school or it opens up that field for us. I think that's very important. I think my concerns are living costs in general, but especially for artists, I think artists invest a lot in their work, in the materials. And I think it is hard enough as it is. So I think that's why my hopes are that there's gonna be support for artists in terms of not just emerging artists, but I think to have a career in art is one of the most beautiful things I believe, but I also think that it comes at a great cost and I don't think it's an easy thing to do. My plan is to stay in London for at least the next couple of years. There are amazing opportunities in London, but I cannot live as an artist. I need to work in something else. And one of my concerns is that that's going to be true later after I sort of establish myself. That's one of my concerns. Hello, I'm Marianne Ibrahim. I imagine and I hope for the art to be more challenging and more meaningful. There is a disruption present and the leverage of the market which limits the artistic freedom, exploration and risk taking. And risk is good, risk is important and it allows the capacity for true work and progress. In this art world, we must think more deeply to reinstate critical thinking in and of the art. Many important voices have been underlooked those that today are extremely relevant and whose legacy is critical for the next generation of artists as well as young leaders in order to navigate this uncertain world. Welcome back. Now, there are a lot of voices that we asked to contribute to this episode. And one of the things I'm really clear on from many different people is that there is this trust in artists as not quite saviors, but we love artists. We want them to do stuff for us. We want them to help us to see the world, to negotiate through it and so on. Louisa, there's a lot of pressure on artists at the moment. I think it's really tough. And with the death of George Floyd, there was a really quite grotesque, I thought, scurrying for all the commercial galleries to find the one black artist, usually, if they were lucky, um, in, in their stable to comment, you know, endlessly when climate change happens, artists are suddenly now having to be the, the arbiters on this. I mean, yes, of course, artists might have these as key preoccupations, but they might have a lot of other preoccupations about the quality of paint or the way that, the way that you know, things grow or change or mutate or, or art history. I mean, all these different things. So I think it's a very tough order and actually quite problematic for artists to be expected to be these great kind of oracles and soothsayers and showing a way through all this. Artists are all human beings. I know it's crushingly obvious, but you know, they're as different as we all are. Some are materialistic and grabby. Some are very high spirited. Some are philanthropic. You know, all these different kinds of aspects come into play. And I think it's a tall order for us to do this to our artists when often the institutions lean on the artists or indeed the galleries to try and make them solve their problems. One thing that I think we're going to see more of 
is artists calling attention to the precarity of their existence. Um, you've heard an art student just then saying about they're worried about entering into the world. You know, they're, they're, they're excited about their opportunities, but they are concerned that they might not be able to survive even if they become established. And I think what we're seeing, I mentioned the fees issue earlier on, it's that a tiny percentage of artists are actually surviving through their art. And you heard Ellie from Guts Gallery talking about working class artists. I think it's even more difficult than it ever was to be a working class, brilliant, visionary young artist and to succeed. I think it's highly problematic because of the art schools too. I mean, there weren't any fees. The much vaunted YBA generation of the 1990s Britain, they all came out of a free art education. You know, all these people benefiting now, doing very well in the art world, had a free education. Now you're saddled with debt. You're not going to be the first member of your family to go to, to further education in a precarious sphere like the art world if you're not given some kind of financial support. And I think this is a huge problem. Also, the cost of living in central cities, the fact that you know, to get a studio, just to live, to find a place to live, it's nigh on impossible in any of our major metropolitan centres across the globe, I would argue. So I think art school fees and also expense and cost of living is a huge impediment to, to artists from different incomes emerging now up through the art world. Uh, and I would just add to that, in Britain also we have, of course, massive cuts to uh, art teaching in schools and, a, you know, a government that is trying to encourage everyone to study more math and STEM subjects, which is great, but, you know, complete lack of understanding of the benefits of studying art. So, you know, that that I think adds a, quite a lot of toxicity to the I mix. I think it's absolutely huge. And I think Clary Wallace talks about this thing and it's been cut by 50%. Neil Wenman talks about it. And he works for a mega gallery, but he came through the art school system. And I think just the creative thinking, the fact that we got the Olympics in the UK in 2012 was largely, I would say, indirect as a result of our fantastic art schools. And the fact that artists could, you know, teach and move around. Great artists like Phila Barlow, for example, who came into the art world really late in life, they made their living by teaching and they, they, they showed to their peers. And that was a model that I would argue is completely vanished now. Yeah. And it's interesting hearing Kim Lee Pinder from the Yale School of Art talking about how her students are utterly, well, see, she didn't use this term, but it, it must be petrifying if you're an art student who is saddled with debt. And in the States, it, you're saddled with even more debt than you are in the UK. I mean, the, the, the sums that they are paying for their education, it's utterly astonishing. Georgina, that sense of being a young artist wandering into the art market. It must be terrifying. I assume it's terrifying. Uh, what I see is this extraordinary explosion of what they call ultra-contemporary artists, those born after 1984. And they saw this extraordinary speculative frenzy to buy their works of art. We saw at auction these things arriving very, very soon after they'd been painted. And then all of a sudden, that market collapses, or to a large extent. I had a look at some figures. The market for ultra-contemporary artists fell by 26% over the last year. That's at auction, obviously, because those are publicly recorded. For an artist, this is incredibly stressful because they don't know where their market is anymore. They don't know whether their works of art should be, should be going back into auction. How much should the gallery be charging for them? So I think this is a real problem for young artists. It seems to me what's happening increasingly, because of the lack of funding in art schools, the lack of funding also for our art institutions, they're not going to take risks, our institutions commissioning artists. Um, the art schools, you're saddled with debt if you go there, so you've got to get your career up and running the minute you kind of, you know, graduate. You're being courted by dealers, perhaps, who all converge on the, on the degree shows for some of the major art schools, but it all skews it towards the market, doesn't it, Georgina? So it means, that, you know, the market really has the sway in what kind of art gets made, too, because, you know, video art, performance art, art that relies on research, which is becoming increasingly popular, but how do these artists live because that's not marketable art, even that might be some of the most interesting art that's being made. Absolutely. And there's what they call art fair art, which is art that's sort of designed to be easily transportable, that you can hang on a wall and then take away with you. Branded and goods. And it's true, a branded goods. And of course, the other thing that worries me a lot is, is the sort of branded nature of the galleries. You know, we've got about eight, if that, seven branded galleries like Kogosian, um, branded artists that they sell. Uh, but then... Outside that, 
there is, you know, who, who is going to support them? And particularly the branded artists are producing, quite frankly, what is now a luxury good more than anything else. They're producing a, a series of works of art that are just extremely exchangeable. Before we move on to the market more deeply, Louisa, as you mentioned there about the sort of diversifying forms of art, I wonder if it's at all useful for us to think about an art world. And actually what we're seeing, especially in the realms of contemporary art, is an increasing diversification almost into multiple art worlds that occupy different spaces to a certain I mean, I think it's so interesting now. I mean, you have, you know, wonderful artists like, for example, Imani Jacqueline Brown, Mississippi Delta, she comes from, she's done extensive research on the kind of interconnectivity of the the extraction of oil in the Delta and how it's on the site of old plantations. So it's climate injustice, social injustice, historical injustice. You know, it's not sexy stuff to sell at a booth as an art fair, but it's fascinating and important. Or you have artists like the wonderful Fiona Banner, who actually use one of her enormous um, granite full stops as an agent of a protest by putting it on a Greenpeace boat and dumping it on the, on the shore at Dogger Bank to snag the fishing nets along with all the other boulders. But she also does show it art fairs. I mean, I think artists are being so interesting now in the different ways in which they interconnect with the world around them and indeed make great paintings. I think it's so interesting how, you know, you've got Mark Bradford, new generation of abstract artists, black artists making work in you know, classic abstraction ways, but also about pressing socio-economic political issues, old school Frank Bowling, but also brings in these different things. You have figurative painting being used by, you know, Kehinde Wiley, Yadam Boake, reclaiming art history. So you've got painting is still alive and well, but you also have so much textile now. You have so much ceramic. I mean, I remember the wonderful Kenyan British artist Madeleine Odando. I wrote about her in the 80s for Crafts magazine. <laughs> she was in the International Pavilion at the last Venice Biennale. You know, ceramics has become as multifarious as paint. I, th- I guess one of the things that's difficult to judge is, as it always is in any contemporary moment, what's going to survive, what we can actually really detect as a sort of pathway f- for the future. But I, th- I, th- I do think that a kind of separation of, into different art worlds is, is definitely something that we're going to see increase. I mean, just like there's so many economies, you know, there's so many different strands of the art world. There's so many different forms of practice. Somebody wants, you know, an attractive picture to put on their walls. There are even several different art fairs they can go to, probably in each country now, to be able to do that. I loathe the term Global South, but I think, you know, this is fascinating how that market, that institutional recognition is taking place. We have El Anatsui in Tate Modern's Turbine Hall making, I think, but they keep it secret, one of his amazing bottle top pieces, super environmentally friendly. You pack it in a box and off it goes. It's also recycling. And one of the forms of art that we are seeing very widely, Georgina, is a kind of art that actually isn't finding its way so much into institutions, but is very beloved of a certain kind of collector, which is people like Coors and Banksy and so on. And, And it seems to me a new generation of collector is really focusing on that kind of work. I'm incredibly fascinated by this aspect of the art market. Because what we're seeing at the moment, we're seeing what has been enormously written about, which is the great wealth transfer, in which this enormous, I mean, trillions of dollars worth of real estate, art and money are going to fall on Generation X and Millennials. And a lot of that's, a lot of that's going to be art, um, art collections that, we built, that have been built up. So far, they've done very well. Paul Allen, for example, died. His collection made $1.3 billion. But we've got lots of others coming up. Um, We've got the Emily Landau collection coming up. We've got Sam Jovesovich. We've got Liao Yicheng, whose Lung Museums have been very big buyers. And all of this is going to come on the market, but is it today's taste? And are buyers today going to want to buy the sort of art that, quite frankly, today might be looking a little bit out of date, will even Picasso, I mean, Picasso was the name to conjure with, wasn't it? It was Picasso, you had to have a Picasso and you almost had a range of prices as well within the Picasso because you could buy a ceramic at one end or a beautiful painting, a Marie Therese at the other end. Oh, there's been a very contested exhibition in New York about Picasso asking about him and then perhaps another generation was interested in Warhol Is Warhol also going to become considered a little bit old hat? And are we going to be looking at things like Banksy, Coors, and all of these other younger artists? And I'm absolutely fascinated because I just wonder, with all of these collections coming up of the baby boomers dying, and it's their collections and their taste, whether actually the market can absorb them all. 
are you saying almost like these got kind of massive collections that come to auction, almost like a last hurrah for a certain kind of modernism or impressionism and the sort of last gasp, therefore, before we enter into a space where institutions are going to be challenged because lots of the art that's selling is actually nothing to do with what they've collected. Uh, exactly. And they haven't. I mean, what institutional shows have we seen for somebody like Banksy or Cause? Cause, I mean, no, Cause has. Culture Park. Yeah. Scores has. And the Serpentine Cause. And the Serpentine Cause. But course. I'm one of the critics who was utterly furious about that terrible show totally. and I think that's the thing is it, it, you're talking about this great change of taste Georgina and that's what it means you know critical taste is going to be undermined or or challenged by this isn't it, it, it it's a new world but there's something else that I think is really worrying in this new world and that is the commodification I really need to talk about the and the fractionalization of art this treating art as a commodity and selling little corners of it. You know, you've got a square centimetre. It's a theoretical square centimetres. There is there are an enormous number of initiatives of fractionalization of art. And I think this is a very, very worrying thing. I think this treatment of art as treating it as something that you make money with, that you keep for a short period of time. NFTs was a case. I mean, okay, that's that's fading now. In fact, it's faded largely. Is that the holding period for an NFT is something like a month. It's incredibly short. This is not, I think, what artists in the past intended when they created a work of art. They were trying to make a statement. They're trying to make a statement about the environment or about beauty or about some other concern of theirs. What are we looking at now? But wasn't it forever thus? I mean, flipping into auction was standard procedure. Books and books have been written just by some of us about art, collecting art, art as investment. And we all know it's a nightmare asset class investment because it's so unreliable in so many aspects. So are you talking about the fractionization of, it's still got to be pretty high end art, hasn't it? You're still going to buy a corner of a Picasso or a corner of a Warhol like it was when you flipped something into auction. I mean, you had to have a certain baseline of value. I've always hated this. Thing. Don't buy art to make money. It was always my mantra. But, you know, artists have always hated the fact their work's been used as an investment. Well, I do think things have changed. And I think they've changed with the advent of free ports, where you can buy art and stick it directly into the free port and then just wait. It's true that the fractionalization of art tends to be established art. But I do think that the holding period for art, I mean, obviously, if you spent a million quid on an artwork, you don't expect to lose money. You hope that you will make money. So it is towards the up, upper end of the market. But I think that we haven't really talked enough about the secondary market and the upper end of the market. When we've talked about artists, we've really been talking about living artists. And I'm talking about the market as well. I'm talking about the secondary market, which is a, still a very important part of the market. I mean, also the word transparency, to my mind, rears up again. As we talked about institutions, the art market is the last great unregulated market. I mean, stuff goes on in the art market that would be totally illegal in other markets. So maybe transparency would make it a lot easier to be able to more obvious about how you are dealing with secondary market, the deals are being made, the background stuff that's going on. Uh, let me tell you that transparency in the art market is not going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> as long so. as galleries and auction houses have any say in it. There was an initiative in Basel of quite a few years ago before COVID in order to attempt to regulate it the way there was a sort of voluntary agreement to regulate banks in the same way. And they got together auction houses and galleries and curators and everything, and it just died a death. Christina. Yeah, I, I'm curious, Georgina, uh, it, just in relation to what we were discussing earlier with museums and the ethical questions that they face, if you would say that the art market operates in a sort of moral vacuum in that such issues are rarely, if ever, discussed. I mean, is that unfair? For um, example, I'm thinking of Art Basel Hong Kong, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, I think that uh, it does to an extent operate in a moral vacuum, yes. I think that these tend to be sole traders as far as galleries are concerned, not the auction houses. Obviously, they care about their reputations. But um, I think, unfortunately, if they think that there's a fair in Hong Kong and that it's in the convention center, which actually belongs to the Hong Kong government, uh, they will still go to Hong Kong if they think there's money to be made. 
I think it's the same with the environment as well, with, with dealers. I mean, dealers, gallerists, whatever they, whatever they want to call themselves these days, are as various as the artists, as the clientele. And I think some galleries are quite ethical about things and won't do business in certain areas and will take the train and use mycelium wrapping. Mm. Others don't really give a damn because they want to bump up their profits. Just one other point I'd like to make is something that worries me about the art market is the overlap with luxury goods. And I think that this is a very worrying development because I think a lot of artists are now producing art that is actually just a luxury good. And there are also, for example, LVMH, Louis Vuitton, Wetensi, whose owner, of course, is Bernard Arnault and who is the, now the richest man in the world. I mean, they own an arts publication, Connaissance des Arts. They also own two art fairs. This, to be fair, quite small art fairs. So I think there's the sort of the tentacles of the luxury goods market is extending into the art market. And I think this is another worrying development. Georgina, that overlap with luxury goods, it seems to me that lots of the new collectors that you're talking about who are buying cores, for instance, probably aren't that bothered by the distinction between luxury goods and artworks. And we heard from a specialist in Japanese uh, collecting who was well, why why would anybody who has who's a young person who likes luxury goods and likes art make a distinction why why should we be troubled by it I mean that you can look at it both ways I mean in a sense it is wonderful that you can buy a t-shirt with a balloon dog by Jeff Koons at Uniqlo so you can have your Jeff Koons for a f- for five pounds or something like that so in a way there is a democratization but I think that the branding aspect is very worrying because a brand implies a huge marketing machine behind it, adapting the product to tastes. Whereas we hope that an artist has their own individual take on the world and has something to say, which is the exact diametric opposite of what branding is about. That's actually a really nice point to end, because I did want to say, here we are, 250th episode of the podcast. We do this because we love it, right? (laughs) So all of us have been using our critical acumen to have a look at this art world that we are inhabitants of. But still, I can't help but escape the fact that lots of people did mention that they have such belief in art in those little snippets that we heard. We believe in art. That's why we're here, right, Louisa? And artists do make us look at the world in different ways. We can't force them to jump on special issues or give special kind of saviour hit lists, but they make us see the world in a different way. They make our life richer and they transcend the time that they're in and they're also of the time that they're in. I mean, art is a kind of series of miracles, to my mind. I agree, and that's why they should be properly supported and not forced to produce work that is going to sell. Uh, And, you know, I just... Given the opportunity to learn and to fail, which, you know, not a lot of artists seem to get these days, young artists. Uh, I totally agree with you. And I think that we live in a very visual age and that the artist really enhances our visual perception of the world. You know, they have a, a way of seeing things and creating images that's extraordinary and that we lack as non-artists. And so we really need artists. What a lovely way to end. Louisa, Christina and Georgina, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. You can, of course, hear the complete archive of all our 250 episodes wherever you get your podcasts, including other future-facing shows like the Artificial Intelligence Special from the 28th of April this year. But that's it for this episode. You can find us on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Tan Audio, and on Facebook, Instagram, and Threads. The Week in Art is produced by David Clack, Julia Michalska, and Alexander Morrison. And David's also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Christina, Georgina, and Louisa, Max, Benedict, Shanai, Anthea, Bonaventure, Tomas, Clary, Kimberly, Ellie, Neil, Marianne, Vincenzo, and Antonia. And a huge thank you to you, our listeners. We'll See you next week. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.